going to have a time for questions at the end. So I'm going to get started now. Um, I know many of you, I could see from your greetings in the chat. Some of you know me from conducting employee surveys at your co-op. Some of you from boards know me from doing support for your general manager hiring process. Other HR managers know me from troubleshooting HR problems. Um, I'm going to start out by talking about the general manager compensation database. This was a project that we launched back in 2010. A few years before that, Marilyn Scholl Mark, and Mark Goring and I had, uh, from, we're then CDS Consulting Co-op, had put together a process for general manager compensation in which we, we recommended that the board develop a request for proposal and the general manager develop a compensation proposal within the parameter set in that RFP. And of course, one thing that boards really wanted to know was what are co-ops, other co-ops around our size paying general managers. General managers were calling each other to find out you know, what they were getting paid. And we thought it would be, it would save them time and create greater efficiency to have a database where they could enter all their data. It would be anonymous. The access was through co metrics. So co-ops that were participating in co-metrics got access to the database. It was NCG co-ops only. And at that time, the database didn't exist to track results by gender, but we added gender to track as an experiment because some colleagues and I had some anecdotal evidence that we thought female general managers might be getting paid less than male general managers, but we didn't really know. So we thought we would track it. Then in 2011, when the database was only a year old, I wrote an article for Cooperative Grocer doing the first new trends in general manager compensation. And at that time, there wasn't much of a disparity by gender. However, that changed. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The data we're going to look at today is from 99 general managers, they've entered their compensation data in the database within the last two years. Many co-op general managers have two-year compensation cycles. So we consider two years to be fresh data. Of this 99, 43 identified as female and 56 as male. Now we did not ask uh, people, we did not give them a non-binary option at that time because we were thinking there would not be enough uh, people to be able to maintain anonymity with that. So some people who are participating in this database made their choice male or female because they weren't given any other options, but they all did choose it. Uh, there are roughly equal numbers of men and women in each of the groups of co-ops I'm going to show you until we get to the two largest. When we get to the 20 to 30 million and over 30 million, there is about twice as many men as women. Uh, in the here's in a nutshell we can see these groups which i divided up by size you can see right here there is roughly a correlation between size and the pay of general managers obviously those in the larger co-ops are getting paid more than in the smaller co-ops but it's not a smooth arc uh, there are some ups and downs within that but we see that at every size, there are some fairly significant differences in compensation. Uh, this, the data we're looking at here is total compensation. So that is the base salary plus the maximum bonus that a general manager could earn under a pre-agreed program. We can see right away here the difference between the, the male and female general managers. That's the blue bar versus the orange bar there is uh, here with the smallest group, it's about $19,000 differences. In the, the smallest co-op in this batch is 1.2 million and it was up to 4 million. There's about 20 co-ops in here. And with each of these graphs, you're going to see 
there is a range showing the highest to lowest paid male GM and the highest to lowest paid female GM. You can see that the men top out a lot higher than the women. This was really quite a, a shock to me to see how great the disparity was, even in these very small co-ops. But we see there's not a big difference between the average base salary and the average total compensation. And the fact is that general managers of the small co-ops are less likely to have any kind of bonus program. Moving up to the next group, again, about 20 co-ops in this group, four to six million, the disparity continues. And again, if you look at the range here, the between highest and lowest paid general ma uh, males, highest to lowest paid females, and it, the men start 20,000 above, the, you know, the lowest paid man in this group is, 20, is paid 20,000 more per year in base salary than the lowest paid woman. In the six to 10 million group though, there is much less of a disparity. This group is the closest to parity. They're about $2,000 apart in the, both the base salary and the total compensation. And in this group, uniquely in this group, the lowest paid man actually starts below the lowest paid woman. But once we get to the 10 to 20 million, the disparity comp returns very strongly here. There's a, a $27,000 difference between, in total compensation between the men and the women with this group. With the 20 to 30 million group, actually the pay is not that different from the 10 to 20 million group, interestingly enough. Uh, but again, the disparity continues between the male and female general managers. And then you get to this largest group, 30 million and up, there's twice as many men as women in this group. And again, we see this really big difference. I wanted to pull up this data from 2016. The size breaks in the groups are a little different, but they're kind of analogous to what we've been looking at. And the differences existed back in 2016, but they're much greater now. For example, the differences in total compensation we see here with the smallest co-ops, about 4,000. And uh, interestingly, the five to 10 million group, which is the closest to parity this time, back then was, was one of the more disparate with an $11,000 difference. But when we look at 20 to the 20, 2021 figures though, again, you can see there's differences are much greater. So we have a trend here and it's been accelerating. Well, uh, the reaction when I brought this up, uh, a lot of men will go, how can this be? How can this be happening? This is messed up. Why is it like this? Well, women all go, yeah, I figured it was like this. <laughs> But some of the questions people raise to me is, is it because men have been in their jobs longer? No, actually, there aren't any correlations between length of service and gender and pay. You could be in your job a long time or you could be in a short time. That won't necessarily dictate what you're getting paid. The correlation is there with gender. Is it because women are all being hired from within while men are more likely to be hired from outside? This is a good question to be asking because when people do come from outside of the co-op world, they often have expectations for a higher salary for the level of responsibility that a co-op general manager carries. But the fact is that we have both male and female GMs who've been hired from within. 39% uh, of the male GMs and 34% of the female GMs, so you know, roughly about a third, have been in their jobs for more than 10 years. Almost all of them were hired from within. There are a few that were hired from outside, but they've been in their jobs for more than 10 years. And the men are still paid a lot more than the women. 
And then somebody asked, well, is it about the cost of living? You know, the cost of living higher, or do the men happen to be in the parts of the country which have higher cost of living and the women happen to be in parts of the country with lower cost of living? And I'm just saying, no, a cost of living is a real factor. It does come up when general managers are negotiating, especially when they're being newly hired and especially if they're moving into a, a community, they will definitely bring up cost of living. But we don't have the male general managers are not all concentrated in the higher cost areas of the country and vice versa. Well, so I wanted to understand more of what was going on. So I had conversations with 30 women GMs and many of you are on this call tonight, I see. Um, and I would say from those conversations that there were four rough categories that these general managers fell into. One was don't be so pushy, don't be so aggressive, don't advocate for yourself. Uh, and this was very painful to hear these stories. And I would say there are about half a dozen general managers who I spoke to were in this situation. They do try to advocate for themselves. They do point out the disparity in their pay. Uh, from uh, Some of them succeeded, a male general manager got paid a lot more than they are getting paid. But that doesn't carry any weight, apparently, with their boards. Then there's the group that's the opposite. They'd say, I did advocate for myself and I won respect. I now have a respectful relationship with my board. Some of the, there are about half a dozen women in this group. Uh, they said, I found out what male general managers in my size cohort were getting paid. I brought that to my board. They went, yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, or I, I was able to find a way to come into a relationship of respect with my board. And I, now I feel well paid. Then this was the largest group. There were women who said, my board tries to give me raises. They try to give me bonuses, but I turned them down. And the reasons for that were often, um, the co-op's not doing very well financially. I'm making enough. I don't need more right now. Uh, I want to put the money into raising my other managers, or I want to put the money into raising the staff more uh, and the, yeah, this was quite a large group out of the 30, I would say. And then finally, there was the group that they didn't say this in so many words, but this is how I heard it is, I don't deserve more. Uh, and the board seemed to agree with that. Uh, it, interestingly enough, a number of women general managers said to me, I don't have a business degree. And I was amazed by that because they, you think that all these male general managers at co-ops have business degrees? This is not common at all. And it's not a criterion boards usually look for when they're hiring a general manager. But um, what I would say about this fourth group, what they have in common with the first group is that the board seems to think that it's okay for the women to be paid lower. And yet it just, this fourth group, I think where the board comes into it, it's more like uh, the general manager shouldn't be paid much more than the staff. We, we should have a very flat ratio and we don't want our co-op to have a general manager who's paid more. But they, and then the women general managers sort of go along with this. So I would say the first group and the fourth group, what they have in common is that the board is accepting that this is the way it is. While the second and the third group, the board doesn't accept that. The board wants to see their general manager well paid, but the general manager's response can be different. Well, so where does this lead? You know, what I thought after my conversations with these general managers, I really felt a lot common with women that are hand, you know, out in the streets demonstrating, still can't believe we have to protest this shit. They were protesting about reproductive rights, uh, but I was thinking that it, we've had this disparity between what men and women are paid the whole time that I've been in the workforce since I started. I was a young person a long time ago. So what happens with this? Why do we have that? Uh, why are we still having to protest this shit? A really powerful force in here is internalized sexism. And I found this quote from this group, Cultural Bridges to Justice, that I thought said it really well. Internalized sexism 
or more accurately, intern it's twins, internalized misogyny and internalized um, male supremacy, have thoroughly taught women two key lies. First, they are not completely competent, trustworthy, or capable of being of real leadership. And second, that men are. I think this runs through everything that we do and we can't avoid it. We need to talk about it. For one thing, these boards that do say to general managers, stop being so pushy, stop being so aggressive. There's women on those boards. You know, this is not all like an all male board doing this to uh, female general managers. And then there's general managers themselves who feel I shouldn't be asking for more I have to put more, you know, like I, I should be giving more to others, which is not a, a wrong thing to be thinking. I want you to be, you know, I want to make clear on that, but we still seem to have this uh, showing up in the data and the pay rates. So I want to look more into the mechanics of this here. One of the things, uh, one of the aspects of total compensation is contingent pay, which means pay that you get based on achieving some agreed upon or pre-established objective. Male general managers are more likely to have that than female general managers. But a lot of general managers don't have contingent pay. And given that many, I won't say all, but many co-op general managers are following the compensation process that Columinate recommends, they're proposing for themselves what they want. I have to assume a lot of general managers don't want contingent pay. And in fact, I did hear that. I heard that from a lot of the women I talked to, but I've heard it from some male general managers too. And I would sum up their position as saying, I love my job. I give 110%. Nothing, you know, giving me more money isn't going to make me perform better. I don't need that. I would rather just get it in my base pay. And I, I want you to be clear that I have no argument with that. Like that is how a general manager feels. They certainly should not be forced to take some of their compensation and contingent pay. Nevertheless, more men than women do have it. And also very few general managers even have any significant amount of contingent pay in play. Like not even as much as 10% of their base salary, only 13 out of the 99 and only five women have any significant amount of money available to them through the contingent pet. And uh, interestingly, uh, a number of women, and I, again, I will say I've had some male general managers say this too, but more likely to hear it from the women, that having contingent pay could lead to manipulation, manipulating the co-op's finances in order to achieve the objective so as to get the contingent pay. And even that this was somehow unethical, uh, and I don't agree that it's inherently unethical, but I do respect the argument that it's not motivating to people. There's another piece to pay as well. And this comes in when we think about saving for retirement. Uh, one of my colleagues who's also consulting for or working in a nonprofit shared an article with me from the Chronicle of Philanthropy and uh, nonprofits have the same problem that co-ops do, right, with pay inequity. And they point out here, pay inequity does not end with the paycheck. Through every aspect of women's financial lives, you know, how much uh, it how much a woman can put into retirement, how much employers add, how much social security benefits they get. All that is affected by the fact that women are getting less than men. However, women live longer than men and need to make do on their retirement savings for longer. The average in the United States is that women live five years longer than men. This is an issue that I'm particularly aware of because I just turned 70. I have been contributing to a self-employed person's retirement fund since 1991. And I can see that, of course, I can see the difference. I can see the achievement that that is and the benefit that it gives to people. So I want to say to women, you need to be thinking about saving for retirement here because your lower social security will make a difference and your lower savings will be have an impact. So deferred compensation is one way of addressing this issue. Just by itself, deferred compensation is simply a portion of compensation that's set aside and invested and paid later. 
one of the vehicles for, well, retirement savings are a form of deferred compensation. And there's quite a few different vehicles for doing this. Qualified, non-qualified retirement plans, some kinds of life insurance plans, supplemental executive retirement plans. They're very, very complicated. Uh, and it's the kind of thing where you'd want to get some expert help in designing them. But uh, non-qualified retirement plans can be very helpful for women saving for retirement, for any general manager for saving for retirement. Um, the co-op could have a qualified plan like a 401k and the general manager can participate in that. But there, in addition to that, there can be a deferred compensation plan for the general manager. There's no contribution limits and it can be given to just certain employees such as the general manager. Uh, now, putting money into deferred compensation, it's still real money. It still costs the co-op, but it's much more valuable to a general manager when she retires to be getting it in deferred compensation than just getting it as a raise. So having gone through this data, talked to all these general managers, I have some recommendations for general managers, and then I have some recommendations for boards. First of all, for general managers, I, I would recommend proposing a policy on the board GM relationship that mirrors your staff treatment policy. After all, the general manager is the board's one employee. I'm going to show you an example of one in a little bit. Research the options for deferred compensation for your next compensation proposal. Get started on it now. Don't do it the week before your compensation proposal is due because it's very complicated. But talk to your insurance broker, get recommendations for people, for compensation professionals who can help you uh, developing a plan. If you get offered a raise or a bonus, I say take it in deferred compensation. Do not turn it down. You are going to need that someday. And then I'd say that forgoing a raise in order to elevate the pay of other staff, that can be a good strategic decision at a given point in time. But I suggest that it not that you not do it year after year after year so that it becomes enshrined as an ongoing practice. There are male general managers who definitely make that decision. They turn down a raise or a bonus. Oops, could we, um, <laughs> I, I just realized this is going a little faster than I wanted to here. Um, there are gen male general managers that do it too, but it seems like they don't do it consistently year after year the way female general managers are more apt to do. Uh, and then I would say that it's worth considering developing a contingent pay plan that does have objectives that accord with your values. So you don't feel like you're manipulating something or you're just, you know, doing managing to a bottom line. Uh, there are general managers who have uh, objectives based on growing membership, growing sales, uh, accumulating cash, uh, if that's what's important at the time for them, uh, they're uh, growing local sales. There's all these different aspects to it. Also, a whole different way of thinking about contingent pay is not as a motivation, not as incentive, but rather as a hedge. Um, for example, there was a small co-op that I consulted with last fall. Their general manager was new and wanted more money than they felt comfortable spending. The co-op was doing well. The general manager had been in their job in a year. They were new-ish. And now they wanted to negotiate a higher, a higher base salary. And the board was uncomfortable with this because they were like, well, COVID and what's going to happen right now, our cash flow is very good. Right now, our sales are growing. But what happens after the pandemic? Oh, we just don't feel comfortable spending so much. And what they landed on was the decision they would pay the GM. He, he wanted 10,000 more than the board was comfortable with giving. They would pay him 2,500 every quarter so that uh, it was the hedge, basically. Every quarter that the co-op met 
a certain uh, a certain net income figure, they would pay that out. It wasn't an incentive to make him perform better. It was more like a hedge against the uh, you know possibility that the co-op's finances could go south again. And then finally, I want to say to female general managers, you might seek out a male GM as a mentor for proposing your compensation. What I heard from those women who felt like they had negotiated a good outcome with their boards was uh, in many cases, they had talked to other GMs, male, oops, male GMs, and um, Th those managers have been like, well, yeah, you know, you should be asking for more. There is something about, you know, like men who don't carry that internalized sexism feel this sense of like, yeah, I'm worth this. It's okay for me to ask for this. And it's really helpful hearing someone else do that and back you up in doing that. Now I have some recommendations for boards. First of all, I think that it would behoove all boards with female general managers to do some self-introspection on whether internalized sexism is at work, both for their general manager and for the board members, and also to look at their personal attitudes about money. Money is a very complicated subject. It's got a lot of emotions, a lot of unconscious stuff tied to it. But I've sometimes heard board members say, well, that would mean the general manager would get paid more than I do. And I think, well, that's not relevant. That should not be an issue in deciding on your general manager's pay. And yet, emotionally, it is an issue. So it's good to talk about it and bring it up to the surface. Also, I'm going to, I'll show you in a moment uh, an example of a policy on the board GM relationship that mirrors staff treatment that the board can hold itself accountable to. Okay, here's a big one. Never put off your general manager's evaluation and compensation process. You've got a calendar. There's a time when you're supposed to be dealing with this. When the board puts it off, it is very dispiriting to your general manager. I know from conducting employee surveys that employees feel very strongly that the evaluation is a time when the, the manager meets with them face to face and that says, you are important to me. I am taking the time. Every time a manager goes, oh, something came up, I'm too busy let, and cancels, or, you know, we have to reschedule. The message they send to the employee is, you are not as important as all these other things I have to do. It's the same thing with the board. When the board goes, we can't get it together to do this on the schedule we said we would. And there's the general manager working without a contract, you know, six months later, the message the board is sending is, you are not important to us. Now, that may not be your intention, but it has a very profound impact on a general manager when the board cannot get it together to follow its own schedule. When your general manager goes to all the work of submitting a compensation proposal in response to a request for proposal from the board, accept the basic framework of that proposal. You can argue about the amounts. The board is the one that decides ultimately what the amounts will be, but accept the work that your general manager has done instead of throwing it out the window and say, oh, we can do this and we can do this better. In the field of human resources, compensation professionals are the highest paid HR professionals because compensation is actually a very difficult and demanding discipline. And it's not something that a volunteer working at a board should expect to be well versed in. Ask your general manager to research deferred compensation plans that will help them save for retirement. This is not often on people's radar, especially when you're younger, you don't think about it, but it will matter someday. I haven't mentioned that female general managers who have children still at home that they're raising have uh, extra burdens to bear. It's that much harder for them. And so I will just make a reference here to the fact that when you ask your general manager to be present, 
at certain events and times, meetings, or their presence at work, consider that they are juggling the job with taking care of children at home, which is something people don't usually expect men to have to contend with. There are more and more men who are very involved in their children's rearing, but it still is a burden that tends to fall heavier on the women. I'm going to say this here that you may have been underpaying your general manager for years and years, but then when she retires or moves to another position and you have to replace her, you're going to have sticker shock. And sometimes it's pretty dramatic. I, there's a number of co-ops that I have consulted for recently hiring a general manager, the, the manager they hired end up getting paid, asking for and eventually getting paid 25, 30,000 more than the former manager was making. So this is a good thing to be prepared for. And one way you can start preparing for it is paying your general manager closer to the rates that the, the market rate, which is what other co-op general managers are getting paid. That is the males and the females. And finally, I wanna to say to boards, value your general manager. It has been getting harder and harder to find qualified candidates for GM positions. And now during COVID, it's almost impossible. Now we think someday the pandemic will be over, but it wasn't like there was a flourishing market with tons of candidates before. So that's something to be thinking about if you're dissatisfied with your general manager, find a way to work on improving that relationship and helping them to improve their performance because it's not gonna be so easy replacing them. Um, I told you I'd share with you a policy on board management relationship. And this one comes from Jackie Arthur, the general manager at Three Rivers Market. The board will not cause or allow the general manager to be treated in any way that is unfair, unsafe, or unclear. Zach mirror of the staff treatment policy for the way the board wants the general manager to treat all the staff. Now, I'm not saying you need to adopt a policy exactly like this, but this will give you ideas. The board will not fail to have an employment agreement with a general manager that establishes compensation and benefits that are internally and externally equitable. And part of equity is gender equity and provides for fair and thorough handling of grievances and is reviewed as part of monitoring this policy. Now, this does raise the question here, is there pay inequity at other levels in co-ops besides the level of general manager? Uh, anecdotal evidence says yes. I conducted an HR audit at one point where uh, I was looking at the salaries of all the people in the top tier of management who reported directly to the GM. And I said to him, why is your store manager who was hired at the same time as your marketing manager getting paid $20,000 a year more? Why is your financial manager and, your, and getting paid so much more than your HR manager, though they've both been here for over 10 years? And well, it happened that the marketing manager and the HR manager were women. It wasn't a deliberate decision on the part of the general manager, but I said, how come these two people that you hired within months of each other, the guy's getting paid so much more than the woman? And I said, I, I bet I know. She asked for less, right? And he said, yes, that's what happened. So he gave her what she asked for and he gave the, the man what he asked for. But that's not how you achieve pay equity. You have to consider this is our pay range and this is what positions within this range get paid. The state of Massachusetts has now passed a law that you can't ask candidates what they were getting paid in a previous job because that just furthers pay inequity when women are already getting paid less than men. Also, some of my colleagues in Columinate who are uh, interim general managers, when they go to manage a co-op while a board is doing a search for their next general manager, they report that sometimes they find women who are getting paid a whole lot less than men. And that indicates to me that, uh, again, and they say they fix it when they see that problem and elevate the women to bring them up into a level with the men. But that, in, that anecdotal evidence is saying we've got inequity by gender in other positions. Do we have inequity by race? Again, anecdotal evidence says that we might. One of my colleagues told me of an anecdote of uh, someone he knew 
a person of color who had been uh, re- uh, promoted to a management position, but time went by and he kept not getting raises and he would ask about it, but it wasn't happening. And um, I'm sorry about this. I just wanted to get one thing at a time here. Um, and, th- and so the, and he ended up leaving his management position and going back to being an employee working on the floor where at least he could get overtime. So, you know, this says to me that inequities could happen. And where they're most likely to happen is when you have unique positions. If your workforce is covered by a collective bargaining agreement, you're not probably going to have inequities by gender because raises will be based on hours worked or they don't, and everybody in the bargaining unit will get them. Uh, or if your co, even if your co-op uses merit raises, you still have multiple people you can look at and say, oh, you know, with these 20 people working in this pay level, how are they breaking up by gender? How are they breaking up by race? And you can at least use your own data to see if you're being equitable. But if you only have one marketing manager, if you only have one HR manager, if you only have one front end manager, one prepared foods manager, that's where the inequity can happen because you don't have other positions that are the same within the organization to show you what's going on. So ultimately what it comes down to is we don't know what we don't measure. So here's some things that Calluminate is going to be doing. Whoops, Uh, sorry. Uh, First of all, we're developing a new database that's going to have some improvements over the existing one. We we expect it will be coming in the second quarter. I'm sorry, I don't know why the slides are moving ahead without my touching them, but if I get back to it here. So uh, this new database will continue to have uh, data for general managers that will be accessible to general managers only so we can maintain anonymity. But we're also going to create uh, new layers for other positions, administrative and department manager positions. So this way, co-ops will be able to find out what co-ops are paying marketing managers, you know, what co-ops of the same size are paying their prepared foods managers and so on. What general managers tell me right now is that they call five other managers and say, what are you paying your marketing manager? So we think let's make that easier and more efficient for them and have a better and have better data because a lot more data points. And this will also allow us and we'll be able to track by by gender and by race. And we'll be able to see over time as we populate the database, we'll be able to see over time whether there's inequity with other positions. Also uh, coming up in second quarter, I'm going to lead two workshops for general managers and boards. One's going to focus on contingent pay and the other on deferred compensation. And we're going to have panels with general managers who do have those, do use that form of compensation now to share their different experiences and look at different models. CBuild is going to be having another workshop and new tools for general manager compensation and evaluation. And also, this is very exciting because we've been wanting to do this ever since uh, Calluminate took on the assets of CGEN, uh, the co- uh, Cooperative Grocers Network. But we're finally going to debut a job board in which uh, open positions can be posted. My final thing here I'll say before we start taking questions is I've got some particular people I want to express gratitude. Kate Sumberg of Cometrics has worked with me on the GM Co-op database for 10 years, sporadically when we go to do a big update. She volunteers her time as I have been volunteering mine and I couldn't have done it without her. I also want to thank Certain of my colleagues at Calluminate, we've all been working together on this project. Brittany Baird, Jeannie Wells, Leslie Watson, Mark Goring, Rachel Krauss, Joel Brock. Uh, others support it, you know, they provide a lot of moral support, but those colleagues in particular, we've done a lot of work together on this. And I want to thank National Co-op Grocers for supporting the updating of our database and our general manager services. Okay. Leslie, yeah. you 
curate some uh, chat questions here for me. And I'm going to yeah. go back to, um, I think I'll go back to the GM and board um, screens here just to have them up here. Okay. Yeah. And folks have um, been, um, um, several questions have come in on the Q&A and we're also seeing some questions pop in in chat. And I just welcome people to pop them in either place and I'll I'll do my best to keep track. So there's a couple questions that just, um, you know, um, just, I'm going to take them a little bit out of order. So don't worry that I'm skipping you, but I did see um, a couple that are just curious, a couple just curious about um, how you got the data and questions kind of about the granular, you know, granular questions about the data. So um, one, one is, um, uh, let's see, um, is there a way, uh, questions about the data in particular, so is there a way to figure cost of living into the database by region or country or size of community? Is that something that is in the works? We have gone over that. We did back at the time when the first database was created, you know, trying to see can we tie into some organization that, you know, maintain, like that maintains what the cost of living is. And uh, the, the, we don't, the data set just isn't big enough to do that. You know, like we don't have enough people yet. And, uh, and I, we might, as we're, there's more and more co-ops, because one thing that the future database will not be just restricted to NCG co-ops, we'll be able to have some startups and some small and strong co-ops that, you know, we'll be able to participate too. Maybe we'll be able to get enough people. But um, what I would say is that when a general manager makes their own proposal for their compensation, they should definitely take the cost of living into account and say, we're in this much more, you know, we're in this, this exceptionally expensive area. But, you know, we don't have many co-ops in what I would call the lower cost areas of the country. They do tend to be in university towns, metro areas, county seats, and so on, where the cost is higher. And every place I've ever done an employee survey, the employees tell me that that town is a lot more expensive than surrounding areas. And the cost of living is really high here. And it may be that the cost of living is high. You know, we, we know it's higher in California than in Iowa, but it's not that different. New York, Washington, D.C., Boston, you know, are as different from California. So I think that ultimately our database, we're going to just have to run it with what we have. And then when proposing compensation, I mean, when looking at what other co-ops are paying their HR managers or financial managers or whatever, co-ops will have to take into account. Yeah, but our labor market, you got to look at your local labor market too, in addition to the co-op database. And are there, I mean, I see some questions kind of asking for specific resources for actually doing that and what you actually look to and what you, what you know, what, like if the compensation database doesn't provide it, how do you actually go about examining that? Well, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has the ultimate, they have the gold standard. It's always a year behind. But, they, uh, but it's from the federal government. They have the data on what positions are getting paid in your area. And it's kind of, um, it takes some getting used to navigating their website. But once you do learn to do it, you know, like once you kind of understand the logic of how it's organized, it's actually very useful. And then something else you can do as a, I sort of like to use this as a point of triangulation between the co-op general manager database, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's called the o Occupational Employment Survey, the B-L-S-O-E-S. Uh, and then for the third point, you could go to those websites like salary.com and payscale.com and you enter a profile that's as close to your general managers or, or even I've done this when trying to help boards figure out what their new general manager is going to want to be paid. You just kind of create a profile for the kind of person that we're looking for and then look at and then they will, they'll come up with a uh, it's free for job seekers, but it costs for employers. But if you pose as a job seeker, you can set up a profile and they'll show you uh, 
where you know they'll show you what the labor market is for that job in your community i wouldn't rely on that only because that's not they don't have a whole lot of data in it unlike the bureau of labor statistics occupational employment survey that has lots of data in it uh, but i think between those three points you can triangulate and then if you have the bucks to pay for a, uh, you know a firm that actually can do the analysis uh, they, you know, there are firms that will do that, but they do charge you for it. I mean, it's not free. Right. Um, so thanks for that. So um, there's a couple questions that are kind of relating to how boards can actually get at this information. So curious of any boards, um, uh, let's see, the question specifically is, um, have boards referenced any sources for salary data and comparative information to support their decisions, create equity adjustments? How do boards actually get at this information? So maybe people, you know, just kind of maybe explaining the GM compensation database access. Um, okay. Protocols. The access is for general managers only. Boards should ask their general managers to be sure to participate in the database. Sometimes, you know, I send an email to a new general manager and ask them and they never respond to me. So that, and then later on their board may contact me and say, oh, we're looking at our general manager, you know, uh, compensation, we're reviewing it. Where can we get data on? And say, you could ask your general manager to participate in the database and then they can pull reports for free. Or uh, sometimes they say, we don't have time to do that, or we're not going to, or if there is no general manager, say the, the between general managers and a board wants to know what should we expect to pay, then that's something that a culminate consultants can do. Doesn't take us very long. We can go into the database and look at look at it to give them a range of what they could expect to be paying. But if they've got a general manager, the general manager should sign up and participate in the database and then they'll be able to pull that. And I also think that the, the general manager should be the one who researches the data and assembles it and presents it to the board rather than the board doing it. Now, this in the old days, before 2008, which is when Mark and Marilyn and I debuted the idea of uh, general managers proposing their own compensation within the parameters of a board RFP. Before that happened, it was very painful for boards. They were trying to go and find this information uh, often without, uh, you know, like it took a lot of time and they wanted to know how to do it. We said, actually the general manager should do that research and present the data to you. That's something you should be asking for in your RFP. Because, and one reason to do that too is the general manager is the one who knows what they want. One thing that happened before general managers proposed their own compensation was uh, there would be like boards would create uh, bonus programs, I mean, you know, contingent pay, and the gen and here you know they would create a formula, this much money for achieving this objective, and over and over again I would hear from the general manager they never asked me what I thought of it. It was just something the board did because it, it looked good to them on paper. And that's one reason why having general managers proposing their compensation is good. But boards should set the parameters of that in their RFP and they should say, show us the data. And a board could say, okay, you've shown us the data. You want X, we want, we want to give you X minus $5,000, here's what. You know, the board doesn't have to just give the general manager whatever they ask for, it, but let the GM do the research and make the case. It's a very efficient use of time, actually. Great. Um, there's a couple of questions, um, Carolee, that you could actually, I think, provide answers to just by switching your slides. So one is that, so maybe a minute on one slide and a minute on another, but somebody wanted to actually see that proposed or that um, policy language that you Here it comes. Here it is. Yep. <laughs> so that's one. So maybe folks can take a screenshot of that, or of course the slides will be available later. And then the other one that maybe um, in a minute you could move over to is um, folks wanted, the, what the question was, how does GM pay disparity compare across co-op size in revenue? And I believe one of your slides kind of shows yes. that. So maybe. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna have to go back here. Uh, back, back, <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm not very um, slick at doing this, but we'll get here soon. 
Um, I just need to get to this. Okay. Thanks. Well, the disparity, as we saw the 2016, the disparities were different. They still existed. They weren't as extreme as they are now. But I would say that in 2016, it seemed like larger co-ops, the disparity was greater. But in 2021, actually, again, what I found really shocking was how great the disparity was in the, in the smaller co-ops. What's it like uh, $19,000 difference? Whoops, sorry. I don't know why that's happening here. Um, the $19,000 difference with the smaller, you know, one of the smaller co-ops and, uh, you know, like, but then it, the differences go down on that six to 10 million and then they shoot back up. But it's not a smooth, uh, it's not like a straight line because these are 99 different boards making 99 different decisions. It's not one employer doing this. So each board and general manager, they come to, you know, that GM proposes their compensation, the board comes to a decision on it. And it's not necessarily, you know, like, yeah, larger co-ops pay more than smaller co-ops, but the differences between even between 15 million and 28 million, they aren't necessarily like the 28 million pays more than the $15 million co-op. And do you have any insight? Do you have any any um, insights into the why why there was that shift over those five years? Why it worsened? That was one of the questions that just popped up. Well, that uh, I think that I think part of it is that 2016, the the so-called new normal of the greater competition had set in. We were beginning to see the impacts of that. It was getting harder to manage co-ops. Co-ops were having more financial struggle, but that got decidedly worse in 2017, 18, 19, you know, up until the pandemic, which has kind of changed everything, though not in a uniform way. Uh, so I I speculate that the disparity some comes out of co-ops having more financial struggle. But I, you know, cause I kept hearing this from women general managers. I decided not to take a raise because the co-op isn't doing very well. I didn't, and there were some male general managers who have done that, as I said, but not as consistently. So that might contribute to it, but I don't really know for sure. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions have popped up um, about um, both your current approach to, to developing this information and then also um, potential expansion, expansion of that research. I'll start with the latter question because I, I, I think I heard you answer this, but I'll just ask the question. Are you thinking of expanding your research, research to include measures for women of color? Well, we will be in, in the future, we will be including uh, race. And we'll let people say, you know, whether they identify as um, Black, Indigenous, or person of color, and also that they'll be able to identify by gender, including an option for non-binary. So we will be able to have that data in the future. Now, you got to wait for the database to populate some, because we don't want to be in a situation where like, oh, okay, here's 12 co-ops in this size range. And there's one general manager who identifies as a person of color in this group. And, oh, like, here's the, you know, here's what person of color is being paid. Here's what the not, you know, the people who identify as white are being paid. And there's no anonymity for them because they're the only one in the group. But this is changing more and more among co-ops. And also, if we can start adding non-NCG co-ops into the mix, I think that will also change it. And by asking both about gender and race, we will be able to look at women of color too. Yeah. Um, and I think this, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna just run this other question by you because I, I think this may also be a, we're gonna get to it answer, but the question is, is there more or less pay inequity for staff and co-ops depending on the GM's gender? Oh, wow. That's a really interesting question. I don't have that data. You know, it, it would take, it, it could be done. It could be a, a study could be undertaken on that, but I don't know the answer to that. 
as you build out the database to capture more um, positions that might be more possible, it sounds like. Well, it certainly would be for management positions. At this point, we're not anticipating taking on the, you know, all positions within co-ops. We're not going there at this point because as I said, there, there is at least enough data within a co-op to look at internal equity, but it's the, the database will at least be starting out with management positions. That said, I, I mean, it would be possible for someone to make a study of it if they took the time, you know, by research and going to the co-ops that have women general managers and finding out what's their average pay rate and, uh, you know, what's your starting rate and, and so on. Right. Um, so we're still getting some questions about the particular data, but there's another group of questions that I, of course, want to be sure to get to because the folks have been kind of sprinkling them throughout. So um, I think that maybe is there, a, you know, there's questions here that are popping up. We may not have time to because we're getting up on that uh, hour here. And Carolee, is there going to be a mechanism to kind of push out answers or more to come as we track all these different questions so we can assure people that if we didn't get to it, we'll be able to to I, I don't know if we're going to be able to answer all the okay. questions that didn't get asked, but go for it, Leslie. So okay, we'll try. Okay, we'll try. Here. All right. So, um, so it really is about boards. So one question, and I'll just maybe just run all these by you because they're somewhat grouped. The first was, there was just a question, how many boards did you talk to about their process? in the course of this data. And then um, the, another question that's somewhat related to this, I think is, um, well, it's not really quite related to it, but I'll just ask it anyway. Is it considered a useful practice for GMs to want to actively participate in compensation decision-making with their board to be able to discuss with context or is it usual for the board to make a unilateral decision without allowing for dialogue? So kind of a question about, did you ask boards about their process? And then what, are, what is a common process? Okay. I, I did not ask boards about their process. I only talked to general managers that tell me about your the process that you use. So I didn't ask boards to see if they would say something different from what their general managers said. You know, but um, at this point I was trying just trying to study like, What's going on with these general managers? But um, if a board is following the compensation process that we recommend through the C-Build program, um, we, I think that there would be, uh, I mean, that that's the process that we're recommending. I'm hoping that, that a lot of boards and general managers are following it. What I heard from the GMs is yes, they're following it. But I think that having open conversation about it would be like how how you know like yes of course of course you would want to do it and one thing that i recommend is that in terms of the timing for general manager compensation the ideal is that the board that decides the general manager's compensation is the board that the gm has worked for through the whole previous year so you would want to have your compensation discussion i would say two months before the election in which your board could turn over so, and, and you allow two months before that so that there's another month of spillover in case you're not done talking about it at the board meeting two months before, then you can talk, you'll still be able to talk about it the last board meeting before the, the board election. So then that means giving the request for proposal to the general manager several months before that second to the last board meeting. So if you're planning out your calendar here, I would say you come up with your request for proposal at least two months, so at least four months out, maybe even five months out from when the board election is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that leaves the board time to have two meetings to be able to talk with the general manager about how they decide, you know, but like to dialogue with them about why the GM has proposed what they have. And the board could even say, could you come back to us? We want more data. Okay. At, um, so, um, um, let's see, we're right at 7.30. How about if I ask one last question as well, also about boards. And then I will just say, I have observed and we will capture all the questions. There's kind of a lot of questions about like how this data, what exactly the configuration is and how it came together. And I think you are gonna be sharing more information about this project that, you know, you, people might, might get some of those answers as you as you share more about this. So um, hopefully some of those will be answered. But the last question what, that maybe um, might be worth um, um, just taking up for a moment is, is there any guidance on how a board 
can have that self introspection conversation that you mentioned um, being a necessary, you know, step in the boards really kind of taking up this issue. Any thoughts about that? Well, again, when Mark and Marilyn and I first developed this model for general manager compensation, we recommended that the very first step we suggested, uh, we have a question for board members to answer in writing for themselves before they met. And uh, to, so that each person would individually think about their attitudes for money and how that might affect how they felt about the general manager's compensation. I don't know, because I, I haven't been tracking this, so I don't have data on this, but my sense from talk, when I talk to general managers about their compensation process is that they've been in their jobs for a while and the board, the board adopted this process for compensation back at the beginning, they did do that self introspection exercise, but now they don't do that anymore. That's like the past. That was the first time. And now they just keep, you know, re uh, recycling their request for proposal. And, so I would say go back to the drawing board. And again, this is something that, you know, Seabuild has tools and information on. They go back to the beginning of that process and don't assume that because it happened five years ago or more that you don't have to do it again because the board keeps changing. Right. New people come on. Right. A good advertisement for the Seabuild webinar that, we, that we're going to be doing later in the year to really pay tune back into that process. So great. Um, well, good. So um, there's more questions and I'm sure we could go longer, but we're, we're at time. So well, you can save the chat and send it to me. I'll see, you know, I, I can look at it and see if there's something to put out, you know, at, if, if maybe there's some questions I can answer very efficiently in writing, it could go out to everybody. But I, I'm not promising that I can answer every single question. Yeah, I see there's a lot of questions. <laughs> so I will very much value being able to look at the chat and the Q&A afterwards. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you to Leslie for mastering the chat for me because I would have been completely overwhelmed as I look at like 52 comments in the chat. I wouldn't have been able to keep up at all. And again, I want to thank all my colleagues who worked on this project. Uh, and we're not done. This is the opening step of our project and we will keep having webinars and events throughout the year and, uh, out, and roll out our new tools. And we hope that they'll be helpful in addressing the inequity in our co-ops. So I'll say goodbye. Okay, thanks, good night. Good night.